God bless all of you. Thank you so much for your worship, for your presence on this beautiful Lord's Day that God's given us. A little balmy, a little Louisiana weather, a little humidity, but we love it, we're used to it, and so we can deal with it, amen? Great to see you this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, man, you look great today. Tell somebody that, would you? God bless you. I wanna look right in the camera and say to our online family, thank you for joining us. Rustin family, Sterling family, everybody here in West Monroe, the broadcast campus, we're thrilled that you are here and we want to believe in God that he's gonna do something great in your life this day. Speak something to you that you need to hear in Jesus' name. Can we give Jesus one more, just one more round of applause? We love you, Lord. Praise you, God. Uh, we are kicking off a series of standalone messages, really, uh, something outside a normal series that we would do. Uh, summer at Christ Church, and I'm kicking it off today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, Luke chapter two and 2 Kings chapter four, we'll look at those in just a minute. Uh, I wanna talk about God room, God room. Essentially about making room for God in your life, making more room for God in your life. And you say, well, I'm already a Christian. I made room for God a long time ago, 40 years ago. I, made God, I, I gave Jesus my life. Well, I wanna challenge you today that maybe you need to give God some more room, more, more room. Uh, Luke 2 is a familiar story. We recognize it because it's a story about the birth of Christ where we often preach from this text in the Christmas season. I promise this is not a Christmas in June kind of message, but I want to talk to you from this passage and kick us off there. You remember how the events of Jesus' birth unfold? Joseph and Mary had gone to Bethlehem to register for the census and the tax, we pick up in Luke chapter two, verse seven, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I'm talking to us about making room, make room. Everybody say that with me, make room. Come on, Rustin Sterling, make room, everybody, make room. I want to pause right here and right now to say thank you to this church family for being so, so efficient, so willing, so available to make room for hundreds of Christian leaders that gathered on this campus last week from around this nation, uh, for places, distances far and wide, and you welcomed them with open arms. You served them so powerfully, and I want to tell you, this church uh, was able to glorify God in serving other people. And you made room for Christian leaders and some of them came broken and hurting and on the edge of, of calling it quits, but they came and were encouraged and strengthened and lifted. Everybody from the, from the children's ministry to the hospitality ministry, the band, the, 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 the praise team, of media, everybody, all of you were so effective at making room for people who don't normally worship with us. I just want to say as your pastor, thank you for being that kind of a church. It rolls up your sleeve. Year after year, we've done, we've hosted Destiny Conference, Destiny Gathering. This was our fourth year, and you've always, though it's a lot of work, you've always rolled up your sleeves and said, you know what? We're willing to do what it takes to make sure that men and women of God are encouraged and lifted and strengthened for the journey, and you did that this week. Thank you. Come on. Can we just give ourselves, come on, Rustin Sullivan, let's give ourselves a big hand. All of you, thank you so much. Make room. Have you ever tried to make room for somebody on an already crowded bench? Like it's, you, you sit down between two people and there's a space this big, it's not wide enough for your hiney, but you try to get in there anyway. You've done that before, or push somebody off or hanging on one leg on the bench, one leg off. Or may, maybe it's a crowded elevator and you're going up and the, 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 the bell rings and it stops and it's already crowded and somebody says, hey, come on, we'll, we'll squeeze in. And I mean, you're like this in an elevator, like you got a straight jacket on. You've been there, I know you have. Or making, maybe making room in a vehicle or a car. My brother, when I was just a, like a junior in high school, bought a brand new off the lot Carmen Ghia Volkswagen. You gotta be pretty old to know what a Carmen Ghia, let me see how many know what a Carmen Ghia Volkswagen is. He bought a, a green, brand new Carmen Ghia Volkswagen and he, he had it 12 months and it got wrecked six times. He never put a scratch on it. It was his coworkers that got sick at work, barred it, and got on the highway smoking something they shouldn't have been smoking, sideswiped the interstate bridge. Uncle bugged it up. I, got, I managed to cram, it was a two-seater. I managed to cram five people in a two-seat Carmen Ghia Volkswagen before I tore the door off of it. 
I want to tell you, uh, you, can, you can cram some stuff in, in tight places if you want to. Maybe you've said things like, well, I don't have any room for that stuff. I don't, I don't, there's no place to put that. Don't bring it here. I don't have room. Or how am I going to fit this person in my life? Or I'm, my, my schedule is already so overcrowded as it is. From time to time, as our team at Christ Church has expanded, we've been forced to shift around office spaces, getting the right people on the right hallway with the right teammates. And I, I was talking to a gentleman during one of those seasons of shifting offices, and he was looking for a desk. And I said, hey, we got a, we got a desk. It's a big desk, but we got a desk. He said, well, how big is it? Because I don't want to just cut my little office space in half with this huge desk. And I thought about it. This was a massive desk. I said, we, we don't need it. We don't have a place to store it. Nobody's using it. I'd love to bequeath it to you. And then I thought about it, and there was no way that big old desk was going to be able to fit in his little office space. There was not enough room. Just ahead of the Destiny Conference, um, we've had staff and volunteers doing a lot of house cleaning and junking out here at the church. And by the way, your church is just like your house. If you don't throw some stuff away every now and then, you, every closet's going to be filled, every Every storage room is going to be, every drawer is going to be, it just collects stuff. We collect stuff that we think we'll use this later, and later never happens, and it never gets used, and then it gets knocked over and damaged, but it stays in the room or stays in the storage, even though it can never be used now. Uh, virtually every room on this church campus in West Monroe, ahead of hosting the Destiny Gathering, has undergone an intense purging to make room for the stuff that matters and to get rid of the junk that's just a bunch of clutter in this house. I think we all know that if you don't have a, a garage sale or a junk to the dump run every now and then, you're gonna be waiting in unnecessary clutter in your home. Your garage will become like my garage, the catch-all for everything of little consequence. Now, I like my blower. I got me a nice battery-powered blower. That's not of little consequence. I go ahead and tell you, I almost sleep with that thing. I love it so much. I don't love it that much. I, I may be pulling a scab off some previous discussions in some of your marriage because in a room this size with this many people in the room, I know there are some hoarders in the room that they're, they're went elbows to the ribs right there. Come on, look right here. Don't look at anybody. Um, usually opposites, opposites attract. So you've got a hoarder in the marriage and you've got a non-hoarder in the marriage and it is a source of conflict often because he or she won't let anything go. I'll need this. I hadn't needed it in the last seven years, but I might need it in the next two decades. So I'm gonna keep this in my grasp. As a matter of fact, let's take a little poll. How many of you right now can think of a room, a closet, a cabinet that needs to be purged of unnecessary junk? That's what I thought. All of us, man, have the capacity to hold on to stuff we don't need. I had a little minor surgery just recently, and they gave me one of these breathing things. I started to bring it. I said, no, I'm gonna leave that in the cabinet because I might need it 10 years from now. Um, a, a breathing thing, you, you, you suck in and it runs the little the ball up to a certain spot and you do that a certain number of times a day. <laughs> I went to get some styrofoam cups out of the pantry uh, just last week and, and I pulled the styrofoam and on my toe falls this breather deal. I'm not going to use that thing. And if I ever need it again, I promise you, they give me another one and charge me 14 prices for it. I couldn't. They wouldn't wait for me to say, I got one of those. <laughs> not going to happen. We have some new golf carts on the way. They've been on the way for five months, by the way. Something about a, a little chip or something. Anybody? Y'all heard anything about it? Like a chip? It's this chip thing going on. I'm kidding. I know y'all heard about the chip. Um, anyway, by faith, they're coming, and the storage building has been being junked out, cleaned out, rearranged to make room for longer, newer golf carts, but the building is jammed full of stuff, and, but we're making room for the things that are most important in that building. Here's the thought I want to convey to you, maybe a question. What, what kind of room or space do you allow or allocate for Jesus in your life? Is it a section, is it a niche, is it if you carved out a little corner, or is it an attic, or a storage room, a shed, a box, a cabinet, a drawer? What kind of space are you allow, allowing 
and allocating for Jesus? Do you only give him access to the restricted areas of your life or do you give him unrestricted access to every area of your life? I'm just pause and let you answer that question in your own heart. The reason I'm asking because sometimes in our private conversations with ourselves, and I mean, you know, there are no private conversations. Jesus is the third party to every private conversation, even the conversations we have with ourselves. The Bible says that he knows the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. He knows what you think. He knows what your motives are. He knows everything about you. We think, well, I can hide this from Trina, or I, I can hide this from Jimbo, or I can hide this from somebody, but you can't hide it from God. I might hide it from her, but I can't hide it from God. So we, we, we have these private conversations with ourselves, and, and there's the real and present danger of saying something like, Jesus, do anything you want to do in my life over here, but don't mess with my junk. Don't go in this room or this closet or this confined space in the, in the place in my heart because this is my private place where I keep all my junk. Come on, somebody, say, yes, Lord, oh me, help me, Jesus, something, if you're taking notes, write it down. We often give God restricted clearance rather than unlimited access. Jesus, you're, you're, I, I give you the, the keys to these rooms, but Lord, this is my private place. And I don't want you going in there. We, we often give God restricted clearance rather than unlimited access. If you go to D.C. and tour the White House, your access is restricted, I promise you that. They're not gonna let you wander around at leisure. They're gonna, they're gonna be rope lines that direct the flow of traffic. There will be people with badges and, and guns that keep you from crossing the rope lines and, and having full clearance. Total access, they have it, but not you. I was visiting the House of Representatives one time as a teenager. I traveled there to, to D.C. with Rebel Choir, and um, we visited the White House. And we also visited the House of Representatives. As a teenager, I was a rule breaker. I didn't always abide by the rules. I'm 99.999% I'm, I'm sure there were signs or we had told, don't take any pictures in here. But I just want to see, I guess, if I can get by with it. So we're in the balcony of the House of Representatives. And I have one of those old-timey cameras. I have to explain this to some of you because you wouldn't even know. All you know is what kind of, uh, you know, iPhone 13 has got the best camera, you know. It was a camera with film and, and that you had to get processed and it had a little square flash bulb on top. You'd press it down and it had four sides. That meant you could get four flashes out of that bulb then you had to get another bulb if you want to take more than four pictures. Well, this thing, man, I took a picture in the House of Representatives and it filled that place with flash. flash. <laughs> and in about a split second, I had two House of Representatives Policemen, one on each arm, escorted me into the lobby. They took my camera, they popped it open, they pulled the, they exposed my film and, and handed my camera back. Said, you can't take pictures in here, pal. Well, that was, I'd already wasted eight flashballs, man. I got some good pictures out by the Washington Monument you just ruined. They didn't care. Because I didn't have the access to take a picture in that place. The question I want to ask is, does Jesus have full access to your life? Does he have access Listen to me. Does he have access to your thought life, to your private conversations about other people, about your hopes and dreams and desires? Does he have access to your relationships, to your bank account, to your computer? Here's a big one. Does God have access to your passwords? He may not, but your spouse should. I just throw that in for freebie. Does he have access to your bedroom, full access to your fears, your worries, your struggles? Or has he been put behind the rope lines of your life and said, you can come this far? Oh, I'm a Christian, but Jesus, you can come this far, but all these are the restricted areas that are off limits to you. I know it's quiet. I know it's, it's, a, it's a, an area of thought that maybe we all uh, deal with at some point in our lives and sometimes we don't deal with it. Sometimes it's easier not to deal with it. We just keep on going the way we're going. That's why God gave you a pastor, a preacher, a leader to call you and to remind you, man, I need to give Jesus full access 
to every facet of my life. In 2009, Sandra Bullock won an Academy Award for her role in the movie Blindside. It's based on a true story of the Tui family who adopted a 17-year-old African-American man named Michael Orr. The Tuies became Michael Orr's family. They were big Ole Miss fans, and, and he wound up becoming a, a big part of the Ole Miss team and then ultimately a part of the 2013 Super Bowl-winning Baltimore, Baltimore Ravens teams. Amazingly, the Tui family discovered Michael on a rainy Thanksgiving day. He's walking down the street all by himself. And as Lee Ann Tui drove past Michael walking in the rain, this big old guy by himself, something happened. She had a heart vibration, a, a, a spiritual, not physical. And, and something said, I need to turn around and check on that young man. This is what happens when you give Jesus unrestricted access. It's a classic example of making room for God in every area of your life. It's stopping the direction that you're going and turning around to see and hear what God wants you to do in that moment because if you have everything so cluttered in your world and in your mind and in your spirit, everything crowding God out, elbowing God out, trying to get under the basket so everybody's got to get out of the lane so I can get the rebound kind of mindset, I want to tell you, you're not going to be able to hear the voice of the Spirit if Jesus is reclined or, or, or moved to some little restricted area of your life. They ended up adopting this young man who'd grown up in poverty, brought him to their very busy, crowded life, nurtured him through school, and he ended up having a successful college and NFL career. I want to talk about making room for God, at least in the context of today's message. I'm talking about those instances when God puts an impression on your heart, when God begins to open your eyes to something where all of a sudden you start to feel uncomfortable. You begin to feel God pressing in on you and gently nudging you to move forward in some direction, some calling, some ministry. All of us have a mobile phone. We all have it. Um, it's got a ringer, but somewhere on your phone, it's especially important to know this, there is a silence button so when you get to church, you can just silence that thing, right? So you can silence, hit, silence the ringer so it doesn't go off in an inappropriate time. But even though your ringer is silent, there's a vibrate feature, you know this, that though your ringer's silent, the feature, when the phone goes off, there's a vibration that happens, and you can't hear it, but you can feel it. Help me here. You can feel it. So illustration, a great illustration, I believe, that it, what it's like when God starts moving on you. You don't hear the ringer, but you feel the vibration. And you gotta stop and pause and ponder and then Turn, it's a push, a nudge, an urging, an unction from the Holy Spirit when people have decluttered their lives and made room for God by the power of his spirit that we can take a heavily download in a moment like Leanne Tui driving down the road, sees a young man walking down the road on Thanksgiving Day all alone, and it changed that young man's life because she had open heart enough and open mind enough to hear what God was saying. I sat with a wonderful young woman of God and Listen, as I blinked away my tears, she said, I just felt like I need to share my story with you and, and let you know how this church has changed my life. She began to unfold her story about a very difficult life of abuse and neglect and sorrow and pain and loneliness, emptiness, how, how she felt like God was always mad at her. Can I just pause here and tell you God's not mad at you? This is a place where the love of Jesus wants to envelop you, wrap you up. This is a place where you don't have an ugly past, only a future, because God's transforming power will set you on a path that your, 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 your past will change into a beautiful, wide open, glorious future that God has. God's not mad at you. She felt like God was always mad at her, that she never knew the love of Christ until she came through the doors of this building, but she couldn't get past the urging to share her story with me. That, nudging the Holy Spirit, saying to her, get on in there, share your story with Pastor Tom, give something back, be a witness, share your faith, share your faith, volunteer, make room for me, make room for me. And I wanna tell you, the typical response can be if we're not very careful, well, I'm a Christian, I go to church about every second Sunday at least. 
you know, I, I, every now and then I honor God with some finances or I sponsor a kid to go to camp or I attended a retreat. But God's saying, I want you to declutter your life to make room for me. Listen, write it down. If you want to have more of God in your life, you've got to be okay with less of something else. If you want more of God in your life, you gotta be okay with having less of something else. A local businessman called the church office and asked if he could treat me to lunch. I was happy to oblige him, and after a couple of weeks of trying to mesh our schedules, we finally got a date and a time, but the whole lunch thing was a setup. It was just a setup. Took me to lunch, and there was a third man there who was running a ministry, and after lunch, they both insisted I take the two-minute drive to personally visit what was then the Desir Street Shelter, now the Renewal Center. It's been raining hard that day. As I walk through that facility, I'm seeing some faces of the homeless crowd, absolutely no place to go, standing out under a provided shelter, out of the rain, then went inside to meet some beautiful and see some beautiful people who, for whatever reason, doesn't matter, had fallen into a homeless situation. They were using the washing machine, the clothes dryer there, the facility, taking advantage of the showers. They'd just been fed a hot lunch and were drinking a hot cup of coffee. I felt a gentle vibration in my heart. It wasn't my phone. No, it was not my phone. It was the Holy Spirit urging me to do something to help. So I asked the gentleman, hey, how can we help? How can we be a part? Because during our conversation at lunch, I had felt God pressing in on me. I'm hearing the vision. And we've done that over and over. Your church sends out a couple thousand dollars a month across this community helping people who are in bad situations just like that, Grace Place, the Renewal Center, uh, Hope Street Ministries, on and on and on I could go. That Thank you for your generosity to help people who are in a difficult situation. And the Holy Spirit urged me. I felt God moving, pushing me. And now with my eyes wide open, he was, he was saying, now, Tom Lowe, what are you gonna do about this situation? I've been saved long enough to know what that feeling is like. And I, I'm, I may not always obey it instantly, I wish I could say I did. But I know when I've had the hand of God in that moment or heard a gentle voice say, or I did that day, are you gonna make some room for this in the budget at Christ Church? Are you gonna budget for the least of these? And immediately I told them, Christ Church is gonna get behind you and do something to help. I wanna look at this story out of 2 Kings. I wanna show you an example of a woman from the little village of Shunem and how they made room for God. And I'll just tell you straight up, you can't live a successful, faithful, honorable Christian life and not have God move on your heart and impress things on your spirit. I'm simply wondering about what our culture might look like. What impact would the believing world have on an unbelieving world if we would simply recognize what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in the moment and then get busy to fulfill his urgings in our lives. There'll be times when he's gonna gently nudge you and say, will you make room for me right now? Will you take a teenager? Will you take a teenager who has no future and come into their world and help them along like it just happened in such a beautiful way just recently? Will you step in for someone who's elderly and be a resource? Would you be a, a resource for a young family who's struggling in their marriage, but you could come alongside you and your spouse who've got 40 or 50 years of marriage and help them walk through the difficult patch in their own lives? Will you make room for me right now? This is a great story out of 2 Kings. It's a, th there was a prophet in the land by the name of Elisha, and Elisha's gonna be in this story like God is to us, 2 Kings 4, verse 8. Now, it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem. It was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in and have dinner there. And she said to her husband, look, now, I know this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room. Let us make a small upper room, small room, build a small room. Let us build a small room for him. Everybody say, make room. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. 
And one day Elisha returned to Shunem and went up to his upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem I want to speak to her. And when she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her we appreciate the kind concern you've shown us. What can we do for you? See, the what can we do for you moments always precede or, or come after the what can I do for you always come after the moments when we've done something for God. You can't do something for God and not him come back to you and say, now what can I do for you? Even though that wasn't your motive, but God will always come back and say, because you made room for me, this, this, and this. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, if you give even a cup of cold water to the least of these in my name, you will not lose your reward. Over and over and over, the promise of Scripture teaches us that if we will make room for the promptings of the Holy Spirit, if we'll make room for more of God in our life, then God will expand our territory and show us the greatness of his glory in our own lives. I'm reminded of Luke chapter five of Peter. Peter owned a successful fishing business. He owned his own fishing boat in the Sea of Galilee. And, and one day Jesus came by, my paraphrase, hey, Peter, I see you have an empty boat there. Would you mind loaning me your boat so I can do some preaching, push off against the shore a little bit, and let me talk to this huge crowd of people. Okay, well, I got a fishing business to run. This is my talent. This is my gift. This is my livelihood. This is how I make my living to support my family. But I'm going to clear away some of this equipment and these nets on the bow of my boat. I'm going to let you use it. So Jesus preached from the bow of Peter's boat. After church, Jesus said to Peter, now let's go fishing. Lord, we, we fished all night. We hadn't caught a thing. I want you to launch out one more time. And you know the story. They caught more fish than Peter's boat had ever seen. Lord, if you say so, I'm gonna make room for your word in my life. I'll let down the nets. And the miracle that takes place is where he caught more fish than he ever caught before because he made room for God. God made room for him and said, now what can I do for you? Let me give you a very, I believe, a convicting but true statement that we learned from the woman of Shunem and from Peter. There will never be a convenient time to make more room for God. Why is that? Because we love our stuff, our activities, our places to go and people to see and everything that we're longing to do and be a part of in our world. We just can't turn loose of that so that we can say yes to Jesus and to make more room for him. Life is happening, you're chasing kids, you're, you're spending nine plates at the same time. There are meetings to attend, bills to pay, kids to get off to college, possessions to maintain. There's simply no good time to declutter our lives to make more room for God. Ecclesiastes 11 and four, those who wait for perfect weather will never plant seeds. Those who look at every cloud will never harvest the crops. You know why? Well, I think it's probably gonna rain today. It's too, uh, we shouldn't get out there and get everything rigged up and get all the hands out of their comfort and let's go start reaping process. No, it's probably going to rain. And we ought to plant today, but no, it's clouding up. I'm sure there's a storm blowing in out of the Gulf. No, you're never going to get anything done if you're always looking at the externals. You got to make room for God. There's not a good time to make more room for God. But if you, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. Listen, when I retire, when I get the kids raised, when I'm out of debt, when I finally graduate, when I get married, when I finally get my home, when I get it paid for, when I get my career off the ground, when I get that promotion, then, then I'll make more room for God. Then I'll get my life right to God. Then I'll order my priorities. See, if you're waiting for the perfect conditions, you're never gonna move off high center. Then I'll join a small group. Then I'll start that Bible study. Then I'll decide to read the word. Then I'll make sure I'm at church every weekend. Then I'll get on a serve team. When everything lines up, all the stars align, then, then I'll do it. Nope, then will never come for you, my friend. Remember the story in Matthew where Jesus said, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was a stranger and in prison, you didn't visit me. Why? Because there's never a convenient time to make more room for God. Those things take time. And if your time 
the 24 hours of your day have all been allotted to something else, you won't have more time and more room for God. We make room for God. It'll always challenge our personal confidence. You may not always like what God's asking you to do. It may not be familiar, but what he's asking you to do and what God's nudging you to do may not, may not be familiar, but it will, and it will not always be easy. It will generally require some level of personal sacrifice, saying no to something of great value so that we can embrace something of greater value. Letting go of something we love so we can embrace something we love more. When you make room for God, it's gonna feel like an interruption. You'll be headed in one direction because you got a schedule, you got a full calendar, your day's already planned out, and you don't have room for any interruptions. But when you create space for the presence and purpose of God and his dictates in your life, God will show up with God opportunities for you to serve his eternal purpose. And folks, I wanna tell you, that's what we're on planet Earth for. That's why you're still here. That's why I'm still here. Not for my own self-aggrandizement. Not so I can pat myself on the back. Not so I can prop my feet up, make myself comfortable. Not so I can gain the whole world. If I do that and lose my soul, what did it profit? Our whole reason for being is for the glory of the Lord. When you create space for the presence of of God to dictate his will for your life, God will show up and give you opportunities. Last of all, I'll, I'll be done repeating the Bible. This word abide uh, is present. As a matter of fact, in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus used the word abide 10 times in just six verses. 10 times in six verses. Abide in me and I in you. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it'll be done to you. The word abide means to live, to dwell, to remain. It's the expression of God's love to humanity that he would come to us through the power of the Holy Spirit to abide in us. Just 18 verses early in John 14, Jesus is outlining the promise of the coming comfort of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in verse 16 of John chapter 14, he says this, and I'll, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him because he dwells with you and will be in you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will abide. Wish every person in the room would catch this, that as a body of believers, we would internalize this truth about the Holy Spirit and his desires to abide in our lives. Look at it, read, write it down. Jesus doesn't just want to visit with you. Some folks are just happy with a visit. That's not the purpose of God. He doesn't just want to visit with you. He wants to abide in you. Trina and I, along with our two children, moved to Gina back in 1985 with dreams of building a wonderful, beautiful house with a wraparound porch. I was still working in the oil field, and we had plans drawn. We had land cleared for our new home that we were planning to build. And for eight months, the four of us moved in with my in-laws, Trina's parents. I won't tell you the whole story but it turned out to be a nightmare. Uh, not living with, well, not that too, living with them too. Here's the point, everybody at some point needs their own space. Every now and then, we'd all get ready for church or to go somewhere, we'd ask mama, had two full baths, three bedrooms, two baths, and we'd ask mama, mama, are you done, your, can I use your bathroom? And she was gracious, but we all knew that's mama and papa's bathroom, and that they didn't have to share it with us. I want Jesus to have places in my life that he's not having to share with something else. It's his place in my life. He owns it. He doesn't share certain emotions, certain feelings, certain times. It's all his. He owns it. It's not shared with anyone else or anything else. He's not competing with anything or anyone else in his place in my life. It is all his. He's looking for places to stay, not to visit, to abide. When someone's visiting, they usually come with a change of clothes, a toothbrush, a pair of pajamas, some hair product, all tightly packed in a little carry-on suitcase. When they're coming to stay, they pull up in a U-Haul truck, right? I I'm, I'm trying to tell you, Jesus doesn't want a visiting relationship. He doesn't, he's not satisfied with a little tea every now and then an afternoon tea or a morning coffee and a bagel. 
with you. Where he gets to visit you once every other week or once a week. Jesus, okay, Jesus, I got friends coming over, so out you go. I don't, have to, I don't, I don't want them to feel uh, uh, uncomfortable by your presence. You come back in a couple of weeks, we'll communicate, we'll spend some time together. That's not what Jesus wants. The Shunammite woman built a room and furnished it with a bed and a lamp and a table, and she and her husband went the extra effort and said, listen, we don't want you just to come by every now and then for a visit. We want to build a place where you can stay. We want the presence of God to dwell in our house. We want you to move in when you come by. So we're making room for you. We're making room for you. Heard a powerful word at Destiny Conference this week. The last night, Dr. Phil Brassfield preached, and he, the, the summation of his message was simply this, that you would give a sanctified no to some things in your life. A sanctified no to some things in your life so you could say a sanctified yes to more room for Jesus more room for Jesus. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I know the truth because I know about myself. And I'm just as human as you are. Man, we can let stuff crowd in and crowd out, and if we're not careful, everything and the dog takes precedent over Jesus. God, help us as a body of believers to make more room for Jesus and the power of his spirit working in our lives so we can hear that little prompting, sense that little download, be moved by his presence, and be the body of Christ that God wants us to be, a city on a hill, people engaged, people meshed, a convergence of humanity and godliness where the Lord uses his people to do his work and his bidding in the earth like never before. In Jesus' name. Can we receive the word of God today? Put your hands together and tell the Lord, thank you. <laughs> Bow your heads with me. I just ask you, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? What's God speaking or whispering or nudging you? Maybe to say a, a sanctified no to so that you can make more room for a sanctified yes. Maybe you're here and you've never even taken the first step. Maybe you've never said yes to Jesus for the first time and you've just been hanging around church, or hanging around church people, but you've never yourself made Jesus the Lord of your own life. And today is your day. Listen, I can't, I'm not here to try to convince you of anything. I can't save you. Only the Holy Spirit can strum the strings of your heart and call you up close, strike a chord in your heart so that you could say yes fully, a full yes, a sanctified yes to him. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder right here, right now, across this room, are you in the room today and you know you're not ready to meet God? If you die before the sun goes down today, you know you're not ready to face the Lord. I wish you'd get ready. Today is, can't imagine a better day. Or maybe you've known the Lord, but you just, you just allowed a bunch of unsanctified yeses to come in your heart. And you're ready to give it all to Jesus today. I want you to be bold. Come on, Rustin Stolen. Campus pastor gathering to the stage right now so they can facilitate this moment. Right here on this West Monroe campus, would you just be bold and throw your hand in the air and say yes to Jesus, yes to a sanctified life, yes to a set apart, hold them up. Let me see them high, wherever you are, across this room. Thank you. You put your hands down. Pray a simple prayer with me, will you? Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Give me the wisdom, the grace, and the strength to say no to some things so that I can give a full yes to you. I believe you're the son of God, that you died to save me, you're crucified, buried, and rose again, and you're coming back for a people who have made room for you in their lives. Bless us this day, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Come on, put your hands together and let's celebrate the goodness of God today.